There we go. Okay, so it's great to see people. Um, it's the, today. I'm very pleased to welcome um, the composer Nigel Clark. Um, what we're going to talk about is the substance of what has been for me the longest collaboration that I've enjoyed. Nigel and I met when we were both undergraduate students at the academy and have been working together more or less constantly since, which is a very, very long time, which means there's an interesting trajectory to um, our collaboration. And I think it's worth saying, just to kind of start this off, that, and this is going to sound strange, we didn't really realize we were actually collaborating until some way into it. Now, that may sound like a strange and odd thing to say, but there's a reason for saying it, which is um, uh, discussion about collaboration between composers and performers, and even between performers, was not something which was um, that high on the agenda at the Academy. Um, and so it meant that we had to kind of fall into doing it. Now, um, you'll see that uh, in, I put a link into the the chat, so if everyone could see it, there's a YouTube link, it's a pay playlist. And what I'd like everyone to do is to just go to that playlist and listen to the very the beginning of the very first thing in there, literally for about a minute, and I'm gonna call you out. It's a piece called Parnassus. Um, just go to that now and listen to it, and I'll see you all in a, in a minute or two. Okay, so go to that first link, please. Okay, come back now. That's all I needed was just the opening burst of that. That's all you need. Um, so, just, okay, great. So that, the playlist there basically is an overview of, actually, Nigel and I have actually made commercial recordings of everything that he's written for me, which is quite a privilege, as you can imagine. But I just want to tell a little bit of a story, then I'm going to pull him into the fray. That's the beginning of a piece for 13 solo strings, which he wrote for me in 1986. I'm going to wave something at you. This is the original copy of the score. Here it is. Um, um, I want to just point something out because this is fantastic. So this was back in the day when, first of all, composers hand wrote all their scores, right? Everything handwritten, but more than that, this score, which has lasted four third, oh my goodness, it's lasted, I've got the notations of the first performances in here, December 86, July 87, then many, many performances after that. Um, this score has lasted. First of all, some really things that date it. Apart from the composer's handwriting, there's this printed stuff on the front. Now, Nigel and I are the generation who spent a great deal of time messing around with letter set, so that when you made scores, you got these big transfer sheets of letters, and you, you know, we spent, anybody who made scores was spending hours with this nightmare. Um, anybody who makes models, I do, is familiar, familiar with dry, dry, dry letter set. But here's something about practicality. This score is 30 years old, or 25 years old, whatever. Um, Nigel put this together so well that it's as good as it was when it was made. One little thing which I love about this, these are not single sheets of paper. These are double sheets of paper glued together so that the, and this is, and the set of parts, here's one of the parts, are indestructible. This piece has been played many, 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 many times. Um, and it's, I think that's something which kind of speaks to what I want to begin with, which is, Begin as you intend to go on. Begin as if you intend to make sure that the materials you're using, um, whether it's in your practice or in your work, are materials for life. I, I was kind of really moved to pull this out and realize, you know, that's... Now, Nigel now, of course, uses computer score and everything. So what happened was that we are not even sure where he and I met. He may have a better idea. But at some point in the Academy Canteen, I did the why don't you write me a piece thing? And I have a feeling that I even mentioned a ridiculously small amount of money at that point. I think there, I think there was five quid mentioned. I think there was, there was, there was something like that. But um, I, at that point, and I don't, Nigel won't mind me talking about this, we were both fascinated with, um, I was fascinated with what could be achieved by 
multiple strings, not string orchestra, but multiple strings. And my fascination came from some pieces um, I was particularly interested in a piece by Nicholas Moore called Life Studies for 15 solo strings and a piece by our mutual friend, the great and much missed composer Andres Panofnik, who I um, quite early on was able to work with as his musical assistant. And Nigel was also a friend of his as well. Um, and I think also, Nigel, would you be possible if you could say something a little bit about the influence on you and on the Academy of the other Polish composers at this point? Well, good afternoon. Um, so I'm just thinking back uh, the answer to that question. Um, I was fascinated by Polish composers, um, particularly Mutowski, uh, Pendereski. Uh, there's a composer called Mariusz Dukowski, who I think is, is deceased now. Um, and these people all came to the academy. It's worth saying. Yeah. Yeah. All, all visited the academy, and I wanted to study uh, at the academy with a composer called Paul Patterson, who was a student at Pendereski. So I was sort of that line of, of interest always fascinated me. So the other piece that Peter didn't mention is um, Wojciechowski's Preludes and Fugues, which is uh, you know one of the masterpieces for that type of group. But uh, I think it's fair to say I've never really written for string orchestra. I've written for these um, you know multi instrument divided up instrument parts type string. The symphonietta lineup basically. Uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. but not uh, the normal type. So, um, uh, at the, to begin with, this piece, which was named for um, uh, my ensemble, which I'd founded when I was at school, um, which was very much... Um, I think it's worth saying that the reason I wanted to make sure that we wrote for solo strings was because I didn't regard myself as being more important than the other players in the ensemble. It's was quite uh, if basically these were and remain the best players of um, my generation in the UK. I mean, the people playing the first performances involved I include people like um, um, uh, Cleo Gould and um, um, Philip Dukes and all these kind of people. It was it's it's an amaz amazing lineup. Um, and uh, people who are now sort of the, the, the leading players in Mark Academy of St. Martin in the Fields and that kind of thing. So one of the things we actually talked about was how the piece should be structured around some of the voices in the ensemble. And the idea that an ensemble was a, a collection of individuals. And I don't think either of us were completely prepared for the fact this was going to go on to be one of the things we returned to. Curiously, we didn't start working together on solo music for a little while. It wasn't the beginning of our conversation. And in fact, I remember Nigel saying to me, not so long ago, just at the beginning, he didn't think of me as a violinist. He thought of me as an orchestral director. And I don't think that's, he wouldn't mind me saying that. It was coming to the, coming to the violin was an interesting moment. Um, I think it's probably important to say that I'm a, um, uh, an ex-brass player. And I'm a composer that's coming through the brass playing tradition. So my knowledge, uh, certainly early on, was not knowing you know, uh, the Kreutzer the Sonata and, you know, obvious string repertoire. That uh, has grown on me over the years and certainly at the Academy. Um, the other thing I can say about Parnassus, it was the first time anyone had asked me to write from multiple instruments. So that's my first, uh, you know, more than two instrument writing. So for me, it was very daunting at the time. And as someone that wasn't a string player, um, the whole thing, um, though fun and exciting and everything else, was actually quite a daunting experience. It's one more thing to say before we, we're going we're to get through a lot of material today, is that the score bears evidence of something which is now no longer part of the piece. So at various times in the score, it says, for instance, um, play when the baton of the conductor passes in front of you. So there were effects which were, get, uh, visual effects which were made, and this comes from some of the things which Penderecki and Luther Solsky built into their pieces, which was a conductor going like this, and then the player playing when they saw the baton. Nigel himself conducted the first two performances and none since. Nobody's conducted any of them since. Um, uh, but that, of course, meant that it, that sounds... And if you watch, there is a great performance of the Preludes and Fugues of Lutosławski on YouTube with Lutosławski conducting the Polish Chamber Orchestra. And it's interesting how much that's to do with his conducting. But that ebbed away and the idea of the self 
the self-generating ensemble came vital, which means that in some ways, to play this piece now, you have to come up with a couple of tricks to substitute the fact that the conductor is not giving the signs, which is, you know, that's now no longer part, although you'll see Nigel has returned to this kind of format of players a number of times, but that got factored out. So I want to jump on to um, about, and it was quite a, a, a time before, although we spent a great deal of time talking to each other, it was quite a while before we came round to actually working together on another new piece, despite the fact that he and I have talked probably more together, more than any other two musicians that I know over the past decades. He actually doesn't write huge amounts of music. Um, there are some composers who, 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 who throw pieces at me all the time. Nigel doesn't. I, I, I would say I, it's writing for strings is not something I do all the time. I'm always writing music. Yeah. Um, but I, I think probably we do something, a, a newish piece, once every five, six years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I just want to bring up, let's bring up the subject of the workshop here, because one of the things which I think is fundamental and we kind of accidentally ran into was this idea of the workshop and at some point in the early 90s we decided and this it's amazing how late this happened uh, by that point i was working had worked with a lot of you know should we call them uh it, it, older important composers but at that point i still really wasn't collaborating with people it was still more the you go and play to the composer and they either give you the happy face or the sad face um quite often the sad face and then you get past that and then at one point, um, I actually said, look, I really want a certain kind of piece from you. And I, I, well, this was actually my idea. I said, it strikes me that a lot of violin pieces are about the left hand and not so many of them about the bow. And as a player, the bow is always the thing which I found is most important. And we started talking about... Um, uh, the idea of the Pernambuco, the, the wood which uh, the modern bow has been made from since the early 19th century, which of course was only imported to Europe, not for wood, but for the dye that can be import got from the wood. And Nigel investigated that and got excited about the fact there are all kinds of issues for where it comes from in Brazil, uh, the fact it's linked to all kinds of mafia organizations. The Pernambuco trade is, is a real problem in all kinds of ways. And, and I do remember that I did, he's forgotten this, I'm sure, I made one request about the piece. I said, this is going to sound really crude, I said, I'd like it to have lots of rhythms in three in them, as opposed to rhythms in two. Because what was interesting about quite a lot of the music which was being written at that time, not Nigel's, was a lot of new music tend to do a lot of in four, or you've got complicated kind of things like Bertels, where you get bum 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 like the end of Carmen Arcadia Mechanica Perpetuum, for instance. But I thought, well, I'd like something which does more of a kind of, it plays with more slippery rhythms. And that's all I said. I'd like it to be to do with the bow, and I want it to, to have lots of rhythms which use threes and more flexible rhythms. And I think that's worth saying straight away that the discussion with the composer about what the groundwork for a piece might be is important. So we met in a room with a blank... I think, did you begin with a completely blank piece of paper in front of me, Nigel? Um, I, I think we met up in room 114 in the academy. <laughs> uh, I think it was called the Barbaroli room in those days. I don't, I don't know it's, the, it it's the Henry Wood um, room these days. Yeah, the Henry Wood <laughs> sort of changed but, dynamic. Um, and uh, I would start off by asking lots of questions. So, you know... What, what if you do this? What if you do that? Mm -hmm. And you know, that, so the first um, meeting was really finding a toolbox of ideas that one could think about. Yeah, can I just hold, hold him there? What Nigel's way of doing it is that so if you have the violin in his hand, he'll come up to you like this and he'll start pointing at the instrument and say, What if you do that there? He'll get right up in your face and say, What if you do that there? And, and a lot of the things that, uh, why can't it sound like that? Why don't you ever put the thing there? And it's, it's, it's very, in a really good way, it's really intrusive. And I think in the last talk about collaboration, I mentioned this how far do composer and performer get into each other's area? Nigel has no problem with me anyway of getting right up into 
you know, in, into what it is that I do. So, for instance, I call it the sort of the silly questioning moment. Ask silly questions. Um, so, I mean, I think it. Peter said something the other day which was um, really struck me, obvious to him, not obvious to me, that I'm writing a, a large scale, well, I've just finished a large scale work for him. It's 56 minutes long, the violin and orchestra. And he said, oh, it's really fun because I've found some chords that I've never played before. And to me, they don't seem particularly complicated. But he said, if I'd been a violinist, a string player, I would have written those differently. And uh, sometimes you know, there is an advantage from a composer um, point of view by not knowing intimately how an instrument works. Yeah. So there are happy accidents. But there's a, so that intimacy is really interesting. So the, at the beginning, for instance, it, um, this piece, you can go and see, I won't ask you to listen to this piece now, but on the Reese Pauls page, you'll see commercial recordings of this in the YouTube list, but also a film of me doing it, I think, in Tennessee some years ago. I've played this piece well over 300 times. In fact, Nigel got to the point where he told me not to tell him about performances because it was getting embarrassing. Because um, <laughs> it, when a composer writes you a showstopper piece, then it becomes the thing you pull out of your bag for instance, because I do quite a lot of concerts where I make the program up as I go, and I know, for instance, if a concert's gone a bit flat, if I throw this piece at the end, it's it's the cheapest trick imaginable. That everyone goes, wow! Um, it's it's all kinds of all kinds of reasons. But I want to get into detail here for a moment. So at the beginning, we'd experimented with all kinds of different pizzicato. Like this is a a sol pontitello pizzicato, kind of dry pizzicato. <laughs> But what he noticed while he was listening was that if, as I come out of it, you may not be able to hear this, I pull off, my, my finger has a tendency, as I go into that ponticello, to touch the adjacent G string. So you get that from the off. So the very first note has a cover onto the next string notated on an adjacent, on an adjacent line, indicating literally a control of accident so that wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the listening the what happens if you do that what's that i can hear on the back of it kind of thing should we well, notate that an interesting um i don't know it sounds insulting but a little bow slippage that peter did at one point and it had this sort of mellow flute like quality and that suddenly hang on what's that we, so, that again and peter's going what what would i do and yeah I'm, your bow was quite high up there. So that was that led to what we ended up, and I, ironically, that moved into the kind of, shall we say, the kind of South American thing. Pan, pan pipe flute effect. Yes, which was which was which was this kind of sound. <laughs> Which, interestingly, I've got this violin out, works best on this particular violin. As opposed to the Cremonese instruments I use a great deal, we found that this instrument, this which is a hill violin from the 1890s, produces this sound, the O. Uh, very, very, very well. You can guarantee it. A question for Peter. I'm guessing folk violinists from those sort of traditions probably just do that all the time. It's just things like that are not used within the classical tradition. Mm -hmm. So it's rediscovering probably something that someone else was doing just normally. Um, exactly. Um, uh, one thing to say here is that Nigel's always been very interested, as I've always hinted, as already hinted, as to what the relationship of the, compo the, the performer with the score will be. Now, he makes these beautiful scores and he really hates the fact that one, I write all over them because he makes all this work into it. And then I, but secondly, I have a tendency, a tendency to use the earliest material. So this is my performing part of Pernambuco, which is this kind of, this scrapbook, right? And, he, his, and what he did to try and keep me interested was he covered it with kind of stencils of various kind of generic South American sort of, there are all kinds of strange little drawings on it. There are some rather dodgy things on it, which I'm not going to share with you. I'm not sure whether, did you ever make a modern version of this? Is there, there isn't one, is there? I don't think so. It might be, I can't remember. So, so he, he... He wouldn't play from it anyway. So ex exactly. That's, so, but, so one of the things is interesting, as I think all of us will recognise, is what keeps us engaged with the score? Um, now, I could easily play this piece from memory. There's not a problem. In fact, when I have it and I play it, I turn the pages, but at no point do I look at the music. But I love having the score with me as the kind of friend on stage. 
it's it's I couldn't imagine going on and also because you have to initially the performances I had gave on a long row of stands but then I worked out how there were doable page turns but before we move on from this I want to just bring up one more thing because there's so much to talk about which is one of those accidents so we in the middle of the piece has a kind of very simple actually rather Nigel lyrical sex sections like which is this material um And I've left something out because when we were doing some of our first experiments, I was, this has happened a number of times in our collaboration. Um, as I, I did this, I kind, of, I, kind of, I kind of just fiddled around with the instrument badly after I stopped playing. He said, what's that? My I said, well, of course, well, I, I showed him the whole thing of finger, finger fall, that you can go all over the instrument. So he said, wait a minute, can we put that in? So then it became, with a, it's actually in the um, resource page, you'll see it, there's this page with these boxes, which actually is stolen from Polish notation of kind of interstitial material. So you get this. Which just came from that kind of thing of um, the, the harmony itself, which is. It's just a natural... Like a super Baroque ornamentation. Yeah. yeah. But it's just, it's the thing which Hindemith understood so well. There are certain things which just happen on the violin very easily. This kind of... Uh, um, but the, the fingers happened to fall onto those positions and they became a, if you like, an added layer. But I want to jump on straight on because if, I don't want to get stuck here because why... There's one other thing. Yeah. Um, there was one bit that Peter, either on first sight reading, couldn't play, and he stamped the foot in a little tempo fit. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't that. He's forgotten. At one point, we just. I was. I had suggested, and, and, and I'm very glad we didn't do it. That this piece should be a score de tour piece. So mm -hmm. I thought that would be interesting to make the color. I've done a lot of work with score de tour since, but ironically, Nigel and I have never collaborated on a score de tour piece since. Um, uh, and he was writing me more and more and more difficult chords and getting in the score tour and I couldn't work it out. And eventually I got furious and I, I did this and I, it won't work here. I stopped and it became the version, the, the end of the, Nigel said, what happened there? And so the end of the piece, which you may not be able to hear this, is this stamping. <laughs> which is the kind of climax and it works very, very well on a wooden stage with hard shoes. And it, it, oh, one, it's the only piece I know where you have to jump into the air and do a triple flamenco stamp at the climax of the piece. I have to be very careful because I've got some concert shoes which have very, very hard interiors to them. And occasionally I've basically crippled myself and been unable to walk off stage afterwards. Um, also but, broke a floor in Macedonia. Really. Oh my goodness, yes, we did. We played, it at a, a, to the, I had, we played it to some soldiers at a barracks in Skopje. And they were, the band room was this disastrous, crappy parquet floor. And as I started stamping, the floor started to break up underneath me. So there was dust flying everywhere. There was wood going all over the place. And these soldiers clearly thought I was balmy. Um, yeah, that's my favorite performance. It's actually typical. Anyway, so this actually, the mess, mess uh, okay. The mention of the Balkans takes me to the next kind of stage, which is that uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, I was working a lot with, in various countries, for projects organized by the British Council. This was before the uh, Labour Party decided the British Council shouldn't be doing stuff like this. Um, sorry, it was my government, but they destroyed it. Um, and uh, I was... We were, I was asked if I would do a project with the great um, orchestra in Croatia, the Zagreb Soloists, which is one of the most famous of the Eastern European conductorless string orchestras. And there was a very funny conversation. I rang them up and said, look, I'm coming to do this concert with you. And, you know, they said, oh, we said, we're, we're going to have a new piece. He said, and they said, well, the concert's in November. And so you come maybe, probably you send the music at the beginning of the autumn and you come a week before and rehearse. And I said, no, no, we're not doing that. Um, so because we, came, we, we had money for the project. So I said, well, we'll see you at the, the beginning of the summer. So in the summer of 2000, it was 2000, wasn't it, Nigel? It was 2000. 
Um, we went off to Zagreb, and about a week before we, we left, I started getting calls from the leader of the orchestra, Andrew Kropland, who used to lead at this point, said, well, where's the music? And I said, well, there isn't any, don't worry, don't, don't, you don't need to see it. Because what we decided we wanted to do, and I think this is for composers and all of us working together, was that the biggest problem that I ran into, we'd run into, was resistance. So what happens if we make a piece which is completely tailored to what an orchestra that doesn't like playing new music will do? How do you make that happen? I mean, Nigel has got something to say, I know, about the relationship between new music and what players would actually enjoy doing and audiences would enjoy hearing. I'm certainly with the Zagreb soloists. I think it would be fair to say that they had some unpleasant performance, uh, unpleasant experiences with composers that they were literally handed a piece of music um, to play and they weren't really invested in the project and they perhaps didn't like it and perhaps they were great pieces, I don't know. But the relationship didn't work at that level. So what Peter and I have found is actually if you work closely with people, you, you can almost be a bit of a salesman, you know, that you get investment from the players and even input from them that actually ends up in the finished piece. So mm. it becomes their piece. And I think that I would say is how we, it works with our good service. And before I tell you how that, how that works, it's worth saying that, I'm going to let Nigel go in a minute, that that's something that would then came to be part of the way we rehearsed finished pieces as well. The workshop mm. process should find its way into the way you look at a finished score. Mm. Uh, I have to say... On a separate note, when you then work with organisations that don't like that type of approach, it becomes a much harder uh, way to get the best musical possibilities when people are already locked down uh, with their view of how a piece should be and not willing to have input. I've been with a, a group actually in the Netherlands where I turned up and the conductor was you know, very pleased to have me there. And, and then everything I suggest, he goes, oh, no, but we rehearsed it this way. And I'm quietly thinking, it's a shame. Mm. It could seem much better. Okay, so two things emerged here. Um, with this this project, which I think was a kind of sea change for both of us. One was um, the method we used to, to build the workshop was actually based to a degree on shared improvisation. So um, I have all kinds of tricks for getting people to improvise who don't like to improvise, or kind of all kinds of games and things, basically exciting people to um, work together to, to you, know, you I won't talk about those, but I'm going to get back to something about one well, outcome of that in a minute. But also then Nigel and I started to, to the hunt for the piece. I think every composer knows this, that um, there was a concern about what the piece should be about. And so we started exploring this, this wonderful place to try and effectively sniff out the piece. And I think, if, you know, as opposed to... And I don't want to take anything away from pieces which are called things like Klavierstuck Eins, but the fact of the matter is that most composers will have a, a driver, and we wanted to find something which was germane to and fitted our experience of the Balkans. It was Nigel's first in-depth experience with the Balkans. I'd been working in the, the, first, the first. yeah, I'd been working a lot in the two or three years before in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina uh, and in Serbia and in Montenegro. But it was his first, so I really wanted. I actually was being quite patronising. I wanted him to know why I loved the Balkans so much. And it's worth saying that this was not long after the end of the various wars. So when you went, and, when my first experience in playing and working in Sarajevo was in a bomb out city you know um and that was part of it that uh, we were we were on a rather tour, not touristic but we were trying to find our way in um so uh, we ended up walking around and uh, do you remember anything about that nigel I do, I do i mean um one thing for better or for worse i find very important is to have a subject to write about i'm not someone that's ever as peter would um, agree, write sonata number one or symphony number one or something that I'd like to have a subject I can get excited about. So part of that walking around um, and drinking lots of coffee around Zagreb uh, was finding a subject. At one point uh, there was a church and um, there was an ossuarium where all the bones are uh, you know, in the basement and that became the focus of the idea. But like so many great projects, that actually is thrown out the window a little bit down the line. It becomes the thing, convince yourself that's what it's going to be about, but it isn't. Um, 
And so in the end, it became, I felt, about writing something that had an East European flavour, remembering earlier in this chat, we talked about Polish music, East European, so it was something very close to me. Um, and then I think this thing that we mentioned earlier about the players, the people that you're writing for, having input. So um, building on Peter's story, um, they were quite grumpy, by the way, when we turned up with no music. Absolutely. Uh, I think they were quite livid, actually. And, you know, what are we going to do for the next two hours? These idiots from Britain have brought no music with them. So Peter asked them, could they just play something that they enjoyed playing? So they played something. Um, by the way, it was 12 men and one woman this orchestra consisted of. Um, and then um, we took a break and there was lots of these sort of heated conversations. The, these guys in groups obviously not very pleased that these composers had arrived, what they saw as wasting their time with their music. And then one of the younger people, viola players, sat down and started playing the sort of what to me sounded like a East European um, folk tune. So when we started, I said to Peter, can you ask what that guy was playing? It's fantastic. And uh, Boris Krejimir was. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, they, the orchestra started laughing and became heated and animated again. And I'll let Peter now tell so that story. So here, here was suddenly we found ourselves running into... Balkan, very real Balkan <laughs> history, which was, I said, can we use that too? And they were, going, they were laughing, no, 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 you can't. I said, we have to, and I was going, yes, we have to. And then so then uh, it was actually, um, uh, I said, we can't use that tune. It's a Chetnik tune. Now, anybody who knows their Balkan history knows that a Chetnik tune being heard in Zagreb is absolutely outrageous. And I have a story from um, Respublika Srpska, which will put this into... Um, uh, into, into 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 context. So this was about a year earlier. I'd been doing a project in Banja Luka, which, as some of you will know, is the is the regional capital of a rogue Serbian enclave within Bosnia. This Republika Srpska, which is um, very strange and interesting place. Um, and one night I was in a restaurant there in in the middle of this place um, with. Uh, a friend of mine who is a, a Serbian uh, Muslim friend, uh, Mejana, and uh, there was a band, typical Balkan band of two violins, uh, clarinet, double bass, doing their normal thing around the tables, and everyone was very happy and everything. And then suddenly they started playing a tune, and it was as if ice had gone through the restaurant. And and and, and Mejana said to me, "Oh, shit!" And somebody had asked for a patriotic Chetnik tune. And it literally was like somebody had driven a dagger into the heart of it, because you know everything. I won't talk. I won't give you a lecture on the Three Way War yeah, in the 1940s, but and what happened since. But this symbolised everything, which is literally soaked in blood over the past hundred years of history. And that was what this viola player had had stepped on. But the great thing is that there was there was laughter around it. So effectively, the laughter. He showed personality, and the finished piece actually features something. Yeah, actually, to be honest, something that has a slight stylistic similarity to what he was doing yeah but that's straight away that he mentioned you this was his thing in this piece was something that he influenced also there was this extraordinary double bass player one double bass in the 13th mario Evelic. Uh, mario mm. and he was a guy in many ways though he obviously the double bass and he's not the leader he had the lead alpha personality within the group and we felt we, we needed to give him something to do mm. rather than the, the usual. Um, so by the end of this piece, we had a work that um, had several important features. One, it could be done without a conductor, which was crucial. Uh, two, there were personalities of these players within the work. And three, I suppose, we have a... Um, uh, well, yes, it has an East European flavour, but it also featured a solo for the double bass, an extended solo where he could be in charge because his sort of natural um, comfort zone. So at the end of the day, we had a piece that fitted, I think, like a glove, these players. Yeah. One thing I should say about the work, if you listen to this work uh, in the um, 
work page that Peter said. There is a violin cadenza. It's called the miraculous. Oh, no, we're going. I would get to that. Sorry, don't go too fast. Okay. Into that. Slow down. Slow. Hold your horses. Okay. Sorry. So. So the piece is called The Miraculous Violin. Nigel has skipped over something. One of the conversations which happens, and I think this is actually my wife was slightly involved in this, was we talk a great deal about storytelling. And you had got interested in a folktale, which was a story um, from the kind of Transylvanian forests and woodlands of a violin which had been buried inside a tree. Uh, and that was it that became that became and there are many gypsy tales from that part of Europe of similar things and of course they do link to a rather more loaded thing of the tradition which continued into the 20th century of um, hiding instruments into in the trunks of growing not instruments weapons in the trunks of growing trees so they could be got out later on when you needed them in wars this was even going on there's a book by a man called um, Raymond Carver called The Accursed Mountains about travelling in Albania in the 1990s and watching Albanians carve first world war um, carbines out of trees where they had been hidden and the tree had grown round them in order to use them in the conflict which was they was assumed was going to happen when Enver Hodger fell. Um, this is this is still very much. But Nigel's hinted at something next. This is the next stage. So in two, th 2001, we found ourselves in the Gobi Desert. But by this point, as you can see, we got fairly excited about the idea of what happens when you travel. Um, we've traveled a great deal together. Um, and this you think he talks about sitting somewhere and having coffee. This you know, going somewhere with a collaborator, sit with a cup of coffee, see what happens. We'll sometimes just get on the train in the UK when we're allowed to do that. Go somewhere, sit with a cup of coffee. We did it going for no apparent reason a few years ago to going to Peterborough Cathedral. We spent a day in Peterborough and it ended up with sitting in a, in a pizza restaurant in Peterborough after the wonder of the cathedral with a coffee. And ideas, nothing to do with Peterborough, came from that. So we found ourselves in Ornchi, the, the capital of Xinjiang in, north, in, in western China. And to cut a long story short, two, I'm going, um, we were doing a project there and we had a, there was a kind of mixed orchestra of professionals, students, and actually some musicians from the army that we were working with on a program of new music. I conducted um, a tippet orchestral piece with them, which was very interesting. You try explaining what music, which is about a wet country, um, for, to, for people who've never, ever, ever, ever seen the sea. And Orochi is the furthest place from the sea on earth. You cannot get further from the sea. And explain. It's sea level, actually. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and try to explain a tippet theme like this. Um, <laughs> which is all about wet grass and everything, you know. It, it was fascinating. But in the, we, decided, we decided we were going to do Miraculous Violin there. And about quite soon into the first rehearsal, Nigel said to me, he said, they're never going to be able to play the middle section, the most virtuosic section for the whole ensemble. He said, but we, let's not make them feel bad about that. He said, I'm going to make a cut. And well, pretend the composer's cocked up, yeah. you know, and made a you know, uh, compositional miscalculation. So the idea was, Peter, you're going to do a cadenza based on the material of the work. And what we'll do, we'll do a cut over the, the slightly tricky, um, you know, 20 bars or whatever it was, and say, you know, I, I changed my mind, it's not very good this bit, and we'll do a cut, and the cadenza will, you know, be the pace to get us past that. Because, I mean, there's no, there's absolutely no point in my, I don't believe in ever making musicians feel uncomfortable. It's not their problem, and of course you don't know what you're going to get until you get yeah. there, you know. Yeah. Um, and they would never have played a piece like this before, so it would have been a very positive new experience it's it's yeah. worth saying that nigel was conducting this performance and i said <laughs> and i said okay i'll improvise something it will be clear to you when the end of the cadenza is and you bring them back in with the opening theme which is uh, <laughs> this material right and so fantastic i have to say a four star or three star Chinese general walked out in, in the middle of in, in the middle of, in in the front the front row. Anyway, yeah, so I said I'll make it clear to you where the end of the cadenza is, and I started getting towards the. I thought I might be end with the kind of. And I saw about Nigel to put his baton up. So I shook my head. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, so I tortured him for two or three minutes on stage in the concert. Wait, but the most exciting thing was we realised at that moment 
that the piece actually needed a cadenza. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this then speaks to something which I do we think is important, which is that I I said, well, hang on, I improvised a cadenza. I'm going to go away and make a cadenza, which and the cadenza you hear on the on the recording is mine, but it's not. So. Here's a question which quite a lot... Can I one, one thing to that? Yeah. I think a composer problem sometimes is to think you write the piece, you finish the piece, and that's it. And I, I remember Peter once saying he doesn't really understand uh, musicians that sometimes record a piece that they've not performed that much. A piece, I think, often needs time to grow, and certainly with a miraculous violin, it was certainly longer by the time they recorded it, it had a cadenza in... And through that whole process, one's still polishing a little bit and improving it until we got, I think, a, a pretty good version now. So I think, you know, if you ever are going to commission a composer and you want to record that work, I would let the piece grow with you for a little while. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I would say with the Panambuca piece that Peter talked about earlier, the, probably the tempo's changed somewhat. Um, it's grown and developed into something that probably is now where it should be. I would say, yeah, that's a note about that. For some reason, although I've played it hundreds of times, Pernambuco seems to scare the hell out of other players. And I think yeah. it's only about three or four other people have, have, have played it. I'm not quite it sure. Be only about two others, probably. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, so it means that the notation, it, we talked about this in, in other contexts, in some ways the notation has never been um, f uh, revised to fit what it is that Nigel and I have ended up coming doing with it, because in some ways it's become a, unnecessary because, well, I play it too much and other people are scared. So I think it would be interesting if someone said to us, we, of course, there is now, now I've released three commercial recordings of that, so there is out there. Each of those has got faster. The first recording I did was 10 minutes, and the most recorded, recent recording of that piece, which has not been cut, is under six minutes long now, so you know, that should tell you something. Uh, but just the last thing on this cadenza, which is that um, I know a lot of you, and I've had conversations with a number of you about, say, if you're writing a cadenza for a Mozart concerto, what do you do? So I think, well, if I'm writing a cadenza for Nigel, what do I do? Well, by this point, I not only knew a lot of Nigel's music, I played a lot of it, but I also had quite a lot of it at home, which I hadn't played. So I kind of, he doesn't really know this, I spread it all out on the floor, and I um, kind of just walked around it and picked up specific motifs from it. So what I tried to do was imagine what Nigel would do using his own material if he was writing a cadenza. And that was the piece. It's not really me. I mean, it's it's it, that's uh, now it sounds like an odd model. Um, but let's just jump straight on now to um, how also what you can get from being in a place with a collaborator. Um, uh, I think it's fair to say this this time we spent in this most interesting part of Asia was very moving for us. I think we weren't ready for the fact that um, we were in one of the most ethnically diverse cities on the on the planet, maybe apart from places like London. So the amazing... It's, where you're, it's in the news all the time at the moment. Um, yeah. Uh, because of what's going on there. With, 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 oh, we all know what that is. Um, yeah. But... Uh, it meant that we the, the the shock of finding ourselves in the middle of the desert. In fact, also the shock of finding ourselves the two of us lost in the desert at one point in midday, which was an interesting thing. Don't don't do that. Um, uh, but was that we were very very moved by all of the kind of it sounds very touristic. The sights and sounds of a place where on on the street around you you'll have people who we would define as ethnic Chinese, you'd have, you'd have Yogyos. The institution we were work, working with was divided in half. Every single, um, every single department had a department which was staffed by um, Yogyos and a department which was come from the Communist Party, which was staffed by Han Chinese. So you were always, every time you had to go for a meeting, you had to make sure you took both meetings, which was interesting. Um, uh, and you actually, we actually did sit at meals where we found ourselves being served tofu and what looked like bagels at the same time, because there's a, there is there is the, ex, the extremes of Arab culture there. One particular. Well, well, I just say, where we were was 150 miles from the 
Afghanistan border. Yeah, so and this was 2001. A so melting pot of culture. This was late September 2001, and at that point, it was pretty sure that Osama bin Laden was in the bit of Afghanistan and closest to us. In fact, there was some suspicion he'd come over the border. So it wasn't the it wasn't the least tense time to be there. Um, but one night, it, we were given this. We were taken to this kind of party, and. Um, this amazing thing happened was that every single folk music and folk dance from the region was played to us one after another. This went on for hours. And Nigel won't mind me saying that there was a certain amount of rice wine involved this evening. Um, so you'll see there's a drawing of, of, of dances and some, some, um, and some music there. The reason was halfway through the evening, I'm going to confess this, Nigel leant over to me and said, you have to write it down. I'm too drunk, right? I don't drink, so um, so uh, I as and, and Nigel did quite a lot of very interesting dancing that night. I'd like to say I have it on. I have pictures of this. Um, um, my wife's never seen. <laughs> Anyway, so I sat there with my notebook under the table, trying to notate as much as I could of what was going on in front of me and some of the melodic material. And this found its way into a piece called Lulang, which I'm going to play for you, actually. It's very short. And it's a... Every single musical tradition does this. That they, whether you're talking about um, Mozart writing Turkish music, um, uh, Danish folk music, which uses music from Southern Europe. Um, we are fascinated with that which is not us. And so the sounds and the, a couple of the melodies which come from this um, are all to do with what we heard. Um, so I'll play it and then we're going to talk a little bit about how we got to this. So Nick, I warn you that um, in the middle, your microphone might not be happy. So. One second. Okay. very short and the two things which went into it were I think uh, for both of us were that evening and the experience of a environment which we hadn't experienced before you know extreme desert but again that was another opportunity for us to experiment with very very precise timbral things so um, finding for instance the relationship between a, a nail pizzicato against Colenio. And then a real detailed thing, which I really love, playing pizzicato left hand while bouncing the bow. It's kind of interesting to me that it's 
work, and I've had this, it's not just with Nigel, it's working with people who are not themselves string players that often will find, help me find my way to timbres that I haven't used before. That this is, you know, one of the benefits of of the open workshop. That, and I think one of the things which is worth saying here is the question of how much we trust each other. I noticed uh, how, when, you, when you collaborate, I'm going to use a very buzzword at the moment, how safe do you feel? And I think that's actually very important. Do I trust that he's not going to abuse our relationship? Does he trust that I'm not going to? I think that's something you feel strongly about, Nigel, don't you? Yeah, we, we, we were chatting a little bit this morning, um, and I think what certainly, and it's not always so, but saying with Peter is what I would describe as a safe place when you work. It's sort of doctor patient. He never tells you about experiences uh, in the work process he's had with other composers. It's very private. Um, and very doctor-like, you know, doctor-patient-like, and I think that's very important. Um, I certainly can think of some musicians I wouldn't expose early raw material to, you know, with the, you know, worry being mocked or, you know, ridiculed or whatever the right word is. So I think it probably means I only work very, very closely with three or four musicians. Um, other people I work in more... Um, what would be seen as a professional way, I write the piece, yes, there's a dialogue, and they get their finished work. Uh, Luke Vuitton, then, which uh, Peter knows is a, a brass conductor, um, I would show him if I was working with him early sketches, because we have a relationship where we can trust uh, what the end product's going to be. And I think the, the benefit for a composer, certainly, to work closely with a musician your pieces will end up better. I yep. think it's, that, you know, it's simply um, the player, the performer, the artist will always come up with something that you've not thought of and your piece will be grow, grow strong. And I think it works the other way around as well. Mm. So trust, uh, if you, you know, are musicians that want to work with composers, create a bridge, a safe place, bridge of trust. So that leads us very nearly to the next element I want to bring into the idea of collaboration, which is shared discussion about other things. So in 2003, um, we, like everybody else, was, well, frankly, disgusted with the way that um, our governments were beginning to, to behave. This was this, obviously the, initially the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. And we started having a conversation about what as artists, how do we respond to this? And initially, this is... We started talking about the idea of the sea. Um, uh, the reason we're talking about the sea was because Nigel was talking about the idea that the sea so often has been used as an image of turbulence and an image of the human condition, storms, obviously. And whenever we're chit-chat, chit-chatting, um, uh, he started. He mentioned the whole thing of the Sea of Crises, the fact that not only does the moon have a Sea of Tranquility, it has a Sea of Crises as well. And then, Plague, Sea of Destiny, all, sorts all of these things. kind of things. Yeah. And, you know, the conversation had been going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And then I said, well, of course, then there's that lake of black fire in Paradise Lost. And he said, what? Yeah. I said, well, you know, the devils, you know, get chucked out of heaven and they, they, they're kind of, at the beginning, book one, book one and two of Paradise Lost, they're kind of, they are... Um, laboring in the in 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 this and it, this is where another composer comes into the fray a kind of charming thing so the year um as it, this time went on and this piece we we you talked about it for probably two years before it got to its well, it's it's kind of first incarnation um, I, mean, it, I have to say that um, for an idea you need a vehicle to certainly for a large-scale work with you know, with an orchestra, you need obviously an opportunity. Yeah. So, around about this time, the great American composer George Rockberg had died, and this is actually a whole little story. So, we were—I was at his house in Philadelphia with my very young son and wife, and George's wife, um, Jean, had said to Marius, my son, "Oh, go and find something you want from the house, and you can have it." Right. <laughs> And my someone got the wrong end of the stick. I mean, he was very little. And he came back and he'd found um, 
George's copy of the Gustav Torre Dory illustrated version of Paradise Lost, which is a treasure by any means. And he'd heard the fact that Gene was pre- planning on using, selling some of the stuff to write, make a scholarship fund for students. And he came up to her, you know, this, this sweet little six-year-old, and said, I really like this book, can I buy it from you? And she said, no, I'm going to give it to you, of course. And as soon as I had the conversation with Nigel, I pulled the Dory down from the shelf, which has the Milton has the most incredible engravings in it. And I think it was, you know, this began a conversation where, where the Dore engravings were absolutely part of it. And the idea of what happens um, in those first two books of Paradise Lost found its way into what the piece would be about. I mean, you got completely obsessed by Milton, didn't you, Nigel? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, but also at the at early performances of this piece, we did it with the projections of the Dore on the behind the stage so I, I just love the little train of things of my son um picking this off the shelf and then bringing it and it becoming part of and i think that's worth saying that your uh, one thing your everyday life needs to be part of what you do but also sometimes when you're dealing with with a really big issue you need to do it by so Milton became the, the the metaphor for talking about something which we couldn't talk about directly um and that was a new, but also another element crept into the into the, the workshop, which was to do with how we worked. Because Nigel had this insane idea of writing for a very different combination of instruments. As you'll see, the piece which is called Blackfire is sitting in your resource um, page. You can listen to it later if you're interested. So, Nigel, what did you decide you want to? Yeah. I was going to say one, one thing that you said there, which I think is very close to my heart. What do you do um, in when you're problematic times, you know, how do artists respond? And one of the things I have found um, over the last year with the COVID crisis, I, I find it very annoying that so many great musicians have dumbed down what they do to do online um, performances, you know, lockdown performances. And I, I think it's a time where actually people should show the importance of the arts and importance of what they do, or the um, how, at least showing you how serious you are about what you do, not find cheap answers um, to difficult times. And you know, obviously, a good example would be, say, the Leningrad Symphony. Uh, Shostakovich doesn't do a sort of a light-hearted thing. He actually goes the opposite way and tries to do something that's important, profound, as a response to what is going on around him. And I, I think it's, it's very worrying today watching people cheapen their work by how they responded to a time of crisis. So Blackfire obviously is, is going in the way I believe we should do, is to actually to, to treat the subject seriously. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but could you say about where, where, we do, where did the idea for the instrumentation come from? Um, one area that I work a lot in is with the wind, symphonic wind orchestra, uh, which is a standard um, woodwinds, good brass section of percussion. And um, it's a culture that is um, uh, seen throughout the world. There is a very famous violin concerto by Kurt Weill, which pretty much uses that orchestration. Um, uh, most American universities have these um, instrumental ensembles. Uh, it's not so common in um, Britain. Though after saying that, uh, I, I did uh, spend the early part of my life in the British military, uh, of which you know we had these military bands, wind orchestras, um, and I thought this would be an excellent uh, way to pick the violin against. Um, and we wrote it for a group um, in Alabama. Um, we did the first performance of this work. Tuscaloosa. It's just an idea to do a piece where the devil is the devil. Yeah, Tuscaloosa, where the devil is the hero in what is actually the Bible Belt of America. Yeah, um, but it's also part of the work. You brought the army into there. Part of the working method, getting towards this. There were two things I want to bring up. One was this was the first time that Nigel, he wanted to push me much harder technically. So the way we did this was it's the first time I'd ever worked with him using playback. And so we were spending, again, quite a lot of time doing traveling together. And 
what would happen was we'd set up the workshop in kind of adjacent hotel rooms and he would write overnight in the night and I'd come into his hotel room at some point and he'd say, can you try playing this? And we'd have the playback of the orchestral thing and he'd written something impossible and then asked me to play it with it. And actually the challenge of getting up to speed with incredibly difficult material coming from the computer was really useful for me. In fact, a number of times he would write me something unplayable for the violin, get the computer to play it at me and have me try and play at the same time as the computer until I could do it. And that was actually very, very useful. It was actually using a technology to drive me. But it also went the other way. So I'm very interested in contrapuntal music. And I do remember um, um, one night in a hotel room somewhere in, in Eastern Europe where we were working on some 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 material. And I said, do you realize that material there would work well if it immediately started playing with itself in canon in the violin? And I said, you could go like this. And I started playing it in, 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 in the kind of counterpantal manner. I don't be shouting. He said, stop, slow down. I can't go this fast, you know? So it's the kind of that to and fro. I mean, there are times when Nigel has quite literally hung a, uh, a, 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 a coffee pot and a coffee on the, on the, on the, on the, in a bag outside my hotel room, I think to make sure that I'm working. But this kind of mutual driving of each other became very important in this piece. Um, bring, 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 bring what that piece was about. It was when the, the circumstance that Pete was talking about was actually in Macedonia, in Skopje. And it, again, it was very bizarre that there was a NATO meeting in this hotel, so we would have to go past these armed military to get into the hotel that we were staying. We are about the only civilians there, though I think people didn't realise that. Um, you know, it was a very, very strange situation. Yeah, but we did, there was, there was we had, you know, we're guys of a sort of, these slightly middle-aged guys, and we had a tendency when we are travelling both to, to wear black and have interesting shaped um, cases and things with us, and we arrived at this hotel, and there was, there was, there were military um, MPs, military police on guarding the hotel, and we, we arrived, and, um, and they said, they said to Nigel, are you with the conference? And Nigel said, no. And then they said to him, are you special forces? And and I remember he kind of because he, said I was special. Exactly, exactly. Because we look at like, when it comes down to it, travelling musicians with cases and computers and all wearing black clothes, men of a certain age, you know, what? Who knows? Um, Imagine this is one of the fringe benefits of music is getting to travel and see exciting places. And I remember part of the game that we had was in the lift and having seen these military people was trying to say, how do you think the conference is going? Just to see how much you sell us. <laughs> but so this then brings us back to something which I think was a surprise for both of us, which was that we'd spent, spent a lot of time working and doing pieces which were about experiences which were far from home. Although I'd like to point out that Nigel was born in Calcutta. So, you know, um, it, it, this kind of, this, should I call a kind of malady to pay the, that he has of where is he from? I always think he's kind of from there. He, he lives in, he's speaking to us from Brussels uh, right now, um, where he's lived for a long time. Um, was that we then found ourselves working in the UK with an amazing organisation, which has become very important as a kind of inspiration for both of us, an organisation called Dover Arts Development, which was founded by a group of artists in Dover to look at the question of how art can exist, really challenging contemporary art can exist and actually contribute to an interesting, to a, a problematic community, not doing kind of artistic things in a kind of... Um, Ill, sort of uh, elliptical way and not dumbing down but actually making contemporary art vital to the community now Nigel was born grew up in Kent so he had a lot to say about this and so this is kind of where I want to bring us to into kind of sort of uh, interesting shape um, my wife the writer Melina Scarver was very involved and we came up with the idea of doing a piece which was literally about what did this place mean and uh, idea for a piece of merch, which was a diptych of a, a red poem followed by a string orchestral piece. And the way that this was created was that we repeatedly went and met with our friends in Dover and kind of wandered about until the piece emerged. So it could be, for instance, uh, you'll see, for instance, one of the pictures you'll find on the, on the resource page says it's Nigel and I talking in the grand shaft the Grand Shaft is a late 18th century architectural wonder built into one of the cliffs in Dover 
It's a double helix spiral staircase going down some 30 or 40 meters into the cliff, designed to make sure that if Dover was attacked by sea, then the soldiers could get straight down to, to defend it inside the cliff. So it, Napoleonic soldiers. Yes, exactly. Um, but, of course, this, they're being very worried about class. There are two, it's a double, a double spiral staircase. One is for the soldiers and the other is for the officers to make sure that they didn't find themselves going down the same staircase. We couldn't possibly have that. But so we were hung out in these places, in some of the defences, in medieval churches and everything. And my wife and Nigel talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked, and talked and to a degree. Um, uh, this other element, uh, bringing another collaborator in, became very important because she was finding her way as a Scandinavian, finding her way into a community. She come, but she grew up in a sea seaside community in Scandinavia. And Nigel coming as somebody who was facing things which were very much to do with his background. So away from that. yeah, he, I mean, he'd be worried. He'd be, he, you know, he grew up in. In Margate, which he's been cursing Margate as long as I've known him, and suddenly Margate becoming cool over the past ten years, I think for Nigel has become one of the funniest things imaginable. Um, but, but that. Yeah, I remember, but, but that first gave funny out the um, T. S. Eliot wrote the Wasteland. Then I, I always thought there was no problem finding a title from where I came from, the Wasteland. You know? Yeah, that's what I thought about the whole experience. But this is the thing I'd like to kind of bring us to as a kind of peroration, which is that, and. Perhaps it's the benefit of age, which is that you know, we travel a great deal, we go hunting for things. And I certainly have it with where I live by the river in the Thames. Eventually, you realize that actually what you're hunting for, and he's hinted at, at um, uh, Eliot. Eliot wrote the line, you know, and the end of all of our journey will to be to arrive at the place we started and know it for the first time. And eventually, what happens is that you come to a realization that the place you're from is the place you need to speak to. Um, and the piece, it's got, there's a wonderful moment in the piece, which is called Dogger Fisher, um, is, which anybody, English person will recognise as the beginning of the shipping forecast on the BBC. Um, and the poem, which, which is about, takes about 15, 17 minutes to read, segues into the music through the sound quite literally of the water on the shingle which was done two ways it was done both electronically with with c and also with the orchestra playing rain sticks and i think no, I that recorded it. I recorded it yeah, yeah you did you, re you recorded it so and uh, this is where i want to bring us is that i began talking about whether or not contemporary art and contemporary music could actually speak to people to normal people as opposed to people who are in the know Right. In um, the very first time we played Parnassus, which I began with, we pre premiered it in the bit of East London I grew up in, um, in, a in, a, in a, well, a, the remains of a medieval church. It's a modern church now. It was bombed. Um, and after the concert, this little old lady who may or may not be one of my aged aunts, I can't remember, toddled up to Nigel and he said, I really like that piece. And I can do this because this is my father's accent. I really like that piece. He said, I, I was thinking about it and I could, I could see the waterfalls and the, the rocks and the, and the water. And, and I remember thinking, that's amazing. How many composers have had someone who doesn't know that they're meant to find new music challenging and actually seeing it in the same way they look at a painting? And at the first, the premiere of Dogger Fisher, a similar thing happened. So it was premiered in the Maison Dieu in Dover, which is an amazing medieval building with Victorian restorations, originally built in the 13th century as a hospital for travellers, for pilgrims and for knights. And after the performance, the, the mayor, who at that point was a woman who, ins who would refuse to be called mayoress, she insisted on being, being mayor, which we really liked, stood up and she said, she said, I don't know what to say. She said... Um, I wasn't expecting music to do this. She said, but I've been sitting here remembering that when I was a child at school, my teacher would put on classical music and tell us just to put our heads on a desk and see where the music takes us. And I'm sitting, and she was sitting there in floods of tears remembering that. Now, if music does have a function, it's to, to take people somewhere. And I think for both of us, and for all the musicians there, this was an extraordinarily moving moment. This woman in her late 60s standing up and effectively confessing this to the audience. 
uh, and I think that's one of the things we like to try. You can't aim for that, but not aiming for that seems to be to be rather odd. The idea that you want to make something which doesn't reach out to people, um, uh, and I, it was quite extraordinary. Um, so. I want to make sure that you have a chance to ask a couple of questions. So we're going to, I think, we'll we'll kind of um, leave it there. We're in the middle of a, a, up a big, huge project at the moment. But it'd be nice to know if anybody's got anything they'd like to ask, because, you know, we've talked. So far away. And it looked like he's going to say something. Anyone want to ask anything? Is that... Edit, you have your headphones on. You're going to ask something, sorry. Yeah. Okay, right, okay, fine. You're very technical, what's going on there. <laughs> yes, go. You've muted, there you go. Is that working now? Yeah, a bit quiet, but. Yeah, um, so I mean, really interesting to hear speaking. I'm coming to this from the composer's angle and also as a composer who does. You know, reasonably regularly stuff with electronics and fixed media um, and things. I, I found it really, really interesting to hear um, Peter talk about go going around a place and sort of trying to absorb absorb it and finding sort of curios in in the place. And it, it just really reminded me of, um, of you know, the, the idea of sort of the found sound object, which you which you get in so much um, electroacoustic mm. mu music of, of finding something which is which is arresting sonically for you and bringing that into the frame of a piece as this sort of outside object is that something that you were you're conscious of when you're working with sounds like the sea which are um in many ways so familiar to the to being the point of, of you know of almost cliche of having you know music which evokes the sea because mm. it's this all you know it's such an all-pervading image to represent it so literally is always presents a bit of a tension yeah. Is the question to me? Or yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. I'm looking at Nigel on the screen. But I, I think. I yeah, sorry. Exactly. Um, I think it, it is a discovery thing. I don't think one necessarily starts off with any preconceptions of what something is going to be. I think it is to, you know, let things seep in. An example: I've, I've just been asked to write a piece for a group in the Netherlands. And they want it to be about the mechanics of the Delta project, which is really very exciting. That stops the uh, interior being flooded. It's an extraordinary wonder of the world. But I've already had a conversation saying, well, I need to come down and look around because there's something quite cold about the mechanical side of this thing. I need to find something more. Is it the, the seal population that's down there, the bird population? the river, dike, inlets. I need more than that to find my way into that piece. Um, because it's, though, strange enough, I have written a piece on that subject before, and I can't go down that road, so I, I need to find another entrance into getting excited um, beyond, isn't it fun that a nice group has asked you to write a piece of music? Um, so I, I think it's... I think it's just to be very open and let some serendipitous happening take place. They go, I know. Yeah. And it always comes, but it's not always there in the first place. You know, so we go back to the Ossuarium in Zagreb. That's a, at least that's not a blank piece of paper, but it led, led to something, you know, probably better. And I think the same as with Dogger Fisher, wandering around and, you know, that thing I know so well, the cold dampness, the seagull noises, the uh, the smell of the sea, um, that eventually comes out in this weather forecast type piece. Um, yeah. And of course, Moline's poem, uh, very much, uh, which is a you know, huge poem, um, is then how that then influences what you write. Other composers can be completely different. No. The joke, Peter and I um, had a, a friendship with the composer John McCabe. Well, I'm guessing he wasn't that type of composer. He was much more of a, uh, a fully formed idea of a piece from the beginning. It's worth saying that an extreme example of what you're talking about was a piece which we can't talk about in any detail now, which is one, uh, it's actually not just one piece, but a kind of 
collection of pieces around the the, the life and death uh, execution of uh, Edith Cavill. And mm-hmm. so I think one of the most, for, for me, shocking moments was where Nigel took me to the shooting range in Brussels where she was executed. And we stood there. And, well, one of the things, and it's not to raise it too, is there is the problem of, well, what do you do? You're standing, you're standing in a, the, and a, there is, I think it's worth bringing the true darkness into this, where you're standing literally on cursed ground. And that, and we've, you know, that's that idea of, of the value of something, something important. So, for instance, I'll give you an, an example of that in its stupid, most stupid level. Yeah, go on. Yep. 232, I think, graves there, and everyone has been executed by a firing squad. I in two wars, not one war, two no, wars. Yeah, in two wars. So it has this very unique atmosphere mm. but then you then you can see this comes ridiculous some of you may know that many of the balkan conflicts over the past uh, um, three th- over over a half a millennium have been over a place where a great battle took between took place between the ottomans and the the um the the, the bulgarians in 1348 a place called blackbird field which is not far from kosovo and so we were working in kosovo and so we would we took a taxi out there and there you are the place where you know Quite li- the most recent Balkan conflict until 2004 began over this place. Guess what we, we found? The soldiers to let us into this tower. Yeah, there we were. We got to this tower, and we're in the middle of nowhere. There is a tower, and there's nobody there. And it's it's interesting how symbols can be. T- it was it was banal in the extreme. There were some Slovakian irregulars who'd been from the UN being tasked to, ta- to to guard the tower, and there was nothing. It was literally an Ozymandias moment. And I think I know that may may sound like a, a very extreme way of answering your question, but I think it also speaks to what you're talking about is the the granular thing. The if you take it right down to the the feeling or the relationship between sound and touch of say a stone falling, for instance because Nigel is extremely attuned to these things. And I think um, whilst he doesn't do individual sound pictures of things, I think that the, the, whether it's the, the taste of a bit of food or temperature, he talks a lot about temperature, damp, cold, hot. He's very interested in these. Um, for a year, he lived in Hong Kong when he was a student, and I used to get these letters, these taped letters he used to send to us, talking about, you know, living where we he was living on an island, was there a snake under his bed kind of thing? And this became very important. It's, it's an immediacy to what happens. Um, so that's a very round way of, of answering your question. Every individual has to find ways that they are excited. And uh, I think all these subjects make you want to know, for me, certainly want to know more about it. I mean, that's uh, uh, Blackbird Field, to think that field and its history has caused so much death and uh, turbulence, um, you know, over the years, um, you know, to me is is an extraordinary thing. It's much better than sitting in a room and just doing sonata number one. Mm. So for some composers, that's a perfectly good answer. Yeah. Um, Anything else before we? Uh. Okay, so. Um, I think that's a, a good a good place to wind up. So I do urge you to um, uh, ha- take a few minutes to listen through to some of those things there. Um, as you see, what's on the um, the resource page are the pieces we talked about, and um, uh, I think was to say that. The final thing I want to say is that we're in the middle of a project right now. We're, a project has emerged in the fact that we can't get together. It's, Nigel's been working on this now for, I think, seven months. Um, May the seventh I started. Exactly. Um, and it's it's turned into something enormous. But what I really loved about it was it get, began, as so many of our projects began, with a conversation, what are we going to do? And eventually we found our way to the um, the so-called Prophecies of Merlin, notated by Geoffrey of Monmouth, of the crazed Merlin, there it is, standing standing on the cliff in Dover, in basically drugged out of his mind, hurling bizarre symbolic abuses over the channel. And that's where the piece has kind of begun. Um, so it's... Uh, it, oh, Rio, do you want to say something? Okay, okay. Um, so 
uh, we're in the in the business now of going. He actually said to me, he said, now you perhaps next week when um, you're a bit less busy, can you actually get start doing some of your work and edit some of this thing? Because I've got to in order to work out what he needs from me, I have to learn this 50 minute long violin concerto. And then so you know, work out what the difference is between what I can do and what he can't do. Because I'm listening to it and thinking, that's really exciting. I hope I can do that. I don't know yet. It's going to be very exciting. So um, thanks very much to Nigel for coming. Um, I will see you all quite soon. Um, stay safe. If you're uh, Also, I will, of course, I will add the audio of this to the resource page. So if there's anything you want to check out, do. And do write to me if you have any questions. So um, thank you, Nigel, very much. And see thank you, you very all soon. Much. Thank you for doing okay. Okay. Perfect. See you. Bye.